Hi, welcome back. In this video, we're going to pick up where we left off in the second video, where we were exploring the nature of Jesus' sacrifice as a Passover sacrifice. So to review what we looked at in that video, the Hebrew people were set free of bondage to Pharaoh through the Passover sacrifice. We, in turn, are set free from bondage to the devil by the death of Jesus on the cross. That sets all of humanity free from bondage to the devil. But in order to make that effective, that death of Jesus is a Passover sacrifice. Just as the Passover lamb ransoms the firstborn of the people of Israel, the lamb of God ransoms all of humanity. The Passover sacrifice, to be efficacious, must be consumed. And so, too, the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. And so the evangelist John, in particular, gives us um, quite the explanation of this phenomenon. And we're going to explore that in some detail. But taking into account the perspective we get from Exodus as well. So, Jesus gives us his body to eat in order that we may benefit from his redeeming sacrifice on the cross. But this heavenly meal, heavenly banquet, is anticipated in Scripture, for this is not the first heavenly banquet we see recorded. So we're going to go back to Exodus for a bit. We're going to look at chapter 16 and look at verse 4. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So we see here that God gives them food from heaven. And this, of course, was a very famous miracle where they received this food, this bread, on a daily basis. But God wasn't done proclaiming miracles with food by any means. To see another, we're going to go look at chapter 6 of the Gospel of John. And we're going to look at some details, interesting details of this section. This is John chapter 6, starting at verse 4. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Not a coincidence, another Passover. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a multitude was coming to him, Jesus said to Philip, How are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? This he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, a number about 5,000. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over, that nothing may be lost." So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign which he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. So as we're going to be seeing, part of why they saw this as a prophetic act was precisely the context of the manna from heaven. Their forefathers had been given heavenly food, and now they too were having the opportunity to experience the same. The manna, the miracle of the manna, resounds throughout the spirituality of the Hebrew people. We see another example of this 
in Psalm 78, where uh, this miracle is recounted. So Psalm 78, starting at verse 23, yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven, and he rained down upon them manna to eat and gave them the bread of heaven. Men ate of the bread of the angels. He sent them food in abundance. This psalm is being prophetically fulfilled by Jesus' action of the multiplication of the loaves. The multiplication of the loaves is a sign that heaven itself is being opened and the people of God are partaking of what heaven has to offer. Now, it's in the context of both the feeding of the 5,000 as a fulfillment of this prophecy and having immediately preceded what we're about to read that we now begin our examination of John's famous bread of life discourse in chapter six. Remember, everything we're about to read is in the context of Jesus talking to those who had received and partaken of the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves. So let's start John chapter six at verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him has God the Father set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work will you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My father gives you the true bread from heaven for the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So here begins the bread of life discourse. And here, when Jesus promises food that endures to eternal life, they immediately think of the manna. And much as they had found um, compelling the multiplication of the loaves, they found even more compelling the prospect of food directly from heaven, which endures to eternal life. And now they're looking for a sign. And Jesus is saying that he himself is that sign. He is the bread of life. The bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. This echoes the prologue of the Gospel of John, where the word is made flesh and comes down from heaven. That theme, this theme right here is anticipated right in the very first chapter of the Gospel of John. Well, let's pick it up from here at uh, verse 36 of this chapter. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me and him who comes to me I will not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me but to raise it up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So Jesus is emphasizing here the eternal character of the food that he brings. It is food that leads to eternal life, and he has been sent proclaiming eternal life. This particular saying, though, um, 
didn't go down terribly easily with his audience. Let's continue picking up at verse 41. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. They said, is this not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except him who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So part of the answer to their question, of course, is that Jesus did indeed come down from heaven just as the manna did. Of course, Jesus is greater than the manna. The manna was food to sustain them on the journey to the promised land. The body of Christ is food to sustain us to the ultimate promised land, heaven. That's why Jesus emphasizes, your forefathers ate the manna in the desert and they died. Eat of this bread and you will live forever. Of course, they don't take particularly well to the idea of eating of his flesh, as he puts so bluntly here. But he doubles down. He emphasizes that he is indeed the true bread from heaven. Let's pick it up from there. So we're going to go now uh, to verse 53. So, verse 53. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. This he said in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. So he says here, unless you eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, you have no life in you. This matches up perfectly with what we're discussing about the nature of sacrifice. The Passover sacrifice is not efficacious unless one consumes of the blood of the sacrificed lamb. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is not efficacious unless you eat of the body of the Lamb of God. Now, he emphasizes that this is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. So here he is hinting at the fact that he is going to disguise his body and blood under the appearance of bread and wine, that his body and blood will be truly present even though hidden under that appearance. But nevertheless, they are truly present and must be eaten just as the Jewish people must eat of the Passover sacrifice in commemoration of being set free of bondage. So let's see where where Jesus goes next with this. So we're going to now pick this up at verse 60. Many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at it, said to them, Do you take offense at this? 
then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life, the flesh is of no avail. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you that do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who those were that did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer walked with him. Jesus said to the twelve, will you also go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So in this passage, many disciples leave and God, Jesus, and Jesus, Son of God, does not stop them. He lets them go. He doesn't correct them and say, oh, never mind, it was just a metaphor or anything like that. It was just a symbol. No, nothing of that. He says, okay, you want to leave? Leave. This isn't for you. And then he challenges the 12. Are, are you also going to leave? And what Peter does on behalf of the 12 is he manifests a faith in the prom that the promises of Jesus will ultimately manifest as something coherent. It's not like in the moment that Peter realized, oh, okay, he's just going to disguise himself as bread and everything will be fine. He didn't understand that Jesus was going to be a Passover sacrifice. He didn't understand anything about this, but he knew to trust in Jesus thanks to the miracles that he was working and the way that those miracles anticipated the fulfillment of that which had been prophesied. And from that, Peter is able to manifest his faith. Still, this is a great mystery, the idea of the body and blood of Christ hidden under the appearance of bread and wine. So I want to close this section with a meditation on a hymn about the Eucharist written by St. Thomas Aquinas called uh, Pange Lingua. And so these are going to be verses four and five of Pange Lingua. Word made flesh, the bread of nature, by his word to flesh he turns. Wine into his blood he changes, what though sense no change discerns. Only be the heart in earnest, faith her lesson quickly learns. Down in adoration falling, lo, the sacred host we hail. Lo, or ancient forms departing, newer rites of grace prevail. Faith for all defects supplying when the feeble senses fail. So, St. Thomas, the great theologian of the Eucharist, the great teacher about the Eucharist, emphasizes here that the change into the body and blood of Christ is not knowable by our senses. We take on faith that this is the heavenly manna that Jesus has provided to us so that we have the means of eating of the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. In so doing, of course, this supersedes the liturgies that came before it. Newer rites of grace prevail, right? The Mass is then the ultimate liturgy on earth because it makes present the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So let's go ahead and summarize uh, what we looked at in this video. So throughout the scriptures, we have miracles of food from heaven. And these miracles all relate back to Passover. Jesus, in turn, is the Passover sacrifice offered as a ransom for our redemption. We are therefore required to consume his body and blood to complete that sacrifice. The body and blood of Christ is miraculous food given to us from heaven under the appearance of bread and wine, not knowable by our senses, knowable only by our faith in the promise that Christ gave to us. In the next video, we'll explore how this mystery is worked out 
in uh, the liturgy and the life of the Catholic faith. See you then.